All right, I'm gonna get um, back started here, and then we'll just uh, see where everybody sits down when they're when they're ready. Um, so we're uh, still on top of page two for those who are following along in the handout. Um, I was giving you the recipe for the fertilizer. I gave you that. Um, um, you know, after I put that down is when I integrate my cover crop. Um, like I said, you know, in many cases I don't need to do that. Um, um, when I, if I am going to be t tilling, I try to keep it as shallow, shallow as possible. I really do, you know, if and when I do till, it's really an inch or inch and a half deep, you know, in entirely. It's not, it's not a, not a heck of a lot. And so, what that means is that this recipe here that I just erased is really worked into the top inch or so, um, and really does help kick things into gear nicely. Um, so yeah, prepare the bed. So um, I want to talk for a minute about conductivity. Um, electrical conductivity is, an, is one of the pieces of the puzzle that um, I think Reams was again responsible for bringing forth. Um, I don't think we've got a, a meter here, so I can just give you a rough outline of what it is. Um, but electrical conductivity is um, basically a measurement of the number, of the amount of, of ions flowing in the soil, uh, which I like to use, the metaphor I like to use for conductivity is the amount of calories of food per day you've got available. Um, Anybody who's you know heard of calories might have you know be familiar with the concept. They say adults need 2,000 calories per day on average, which is just a number out there. You know, 3,000 could be 3,000. Um, children need 500 or 600 calories per day. A pregnant woman may need three or 4,000 calories per day. Um, we've got rough ballparks about how much energy you need on a daily basis to maintain yourself. Um, and conductivity basically is that for the soil for the plants, <clears throat> telling you how many nutrients how much nutrient availability is uh, available for the soil, in, in the soil for the plants to eat. Um, and what happens is when you got low conductivity, that means basically you have not enough nutrition, not enough food in the soil for the plants to eat. So conductivity is a really good metric for how much your plants have to eat today. And um, when you see the conductivity drop off, you can be pretty sure your plants are going to um, stop growing. And then if it keeps growing for too long, they're going to get um, sick and die. So it's a really good proactive monitoring technique or tool. Um, um, when I grew up on the farm, I never had even the idea that I could monitor in a proactive manner. It was sort of a wait for the diseases to come. Um, hopefully we've got the next planting coming along because once the diseases come or the insects come, then the plants die and then <laughs> hopefully we've got other planting cucumbers or, or summer squash or whatever it is. Um, so, um, uh, conductivity is measured in um, either millisiemens or microsiemens. Um, I can't remember which one's which. Um, if there was, anybody know milli and micro? I thought it was mo. Or did they change it now? Ohms? Mo ohms spelled backwards. Huh? Mo. Ohms. <laughs> Reams would call it ohms, I think. No, no it was micro. Resistance? Mo's. Yeah, resistance. Ohms, ohms is resistance. Moses conductivity, MHO. All right. Um, uh, the meters I had changed is the Siemens. The, the meters that I've been <coughs> uh, using, like I got from Pike, are measured in, in millisiemens and microsiemens. Different meters are calibrated in different ones. Mm -hmm. If one of these was a milli and one was a micro, do you know, anybody know which one would be which? One would be which? Milli's bigger. So <laughs> oh, yeah, so that would be micros. Micro will be 150. Uh huh. So that's 10 to the minus 6. So we want 0.15 milli. Almost caught it. <coughs> or 150 micro Siemens, like the company Siemens, is what I'd like to see present in the soil when I plant. Um, in many cases, if you've got a conductivity meter and you go out and you actually stick it in your ground right now, you'll have 30 or 40 maybe 50 um, micro siemens um, or 0 0.03 or 0 0.04 um, um, milli siemens. And that correlates nicely with plants that you stick in the ground that don't grow. Anybody ever done that? Put the plants in the ground and sit there for a while? Especially in the springtime? Then the uh, flea beetles come and have their way with them or whoever it is. Um, uh, my experience has been when you get the conductivity up, the plants grow. Um, and that's one of the cheats that, are, that chemical farmers use that works that organic farmers don't, right? When you take salt, if you take a, a glass of, of, of water, put the conductivity meter in it, you should have a reading of zero. You take a salt shaker and take one shake of the salt shaker and you go to 500 or 1,000. 
right? <clears throat> There's nutrient availability in that system now that wasn't present before. And the way it's supposed to work is that the biological activity, the process of biological activity is a process of releasing these nutrients into the solution so the plant has access to them. Um, but if you don't have that biological activity, you don't have a lot of nutrient availability, the plants don't have any food to eat, so they basically are starving to death. Uh, which is what happens when you put your plants in the cold soil and they don't grow. If they don't have any food to eat, so they don't grow. That's why when you put fertilizer down, and 10, 10, 10 or whatever, plants jump up out of the ground because that 10, 10, 10 is a salt which becomes available and raises the conductivity and the plants grow. Um, it's real simple and it, it works. It's just maybe not the most elegant systemic way to do it, um, but it definitely works. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so I like to see my conductivity start at 150 and then proceed in an upward fashion and plateau through the growing season. And one of the simplest things you can do to monitor in a proactive manner how your plants are doing is to go out once a week with your conductivity meter and stick it in the ground and monitor what your conductivity is. This is what you should see. You should start at 150 plus or minus and proceed upward to a plateau depending on what your organic matter is, maybe from 250 to 500. The lower your organic matter is, the higher you want your conductivity to be. Um, but you should see this kind of a trajectory. And what you will oftentimes normally see is something that starts way lower, raises up a little bit, plateaus, and then crashes. And you see this, you know, you're, if you're monitoring along and you see this crash, then you can be very certain that in short order this crop is going to start looking peaked or have holes in it, etc. It's a really, really good proactive monitoring system for assessing overall what's going on. Uh, I get my conductivity meters through Pike Agri, which we had up on here yesterday. Um, I don't bring it with me on the plane because it's got a little probe. It looks like you'd hurt somebody with it. I don't want it taken away from me. So um, the one I have, I think it's cost $89 from Pike. Um, it's shaped about yay big. And it's got this little probe on it. It goes into the soil. A little button turned on. It's got a digital readout. You push the button, you stick it in the ground, and you get the reading. Boom. You pick it up, you move it over here, put it back in the ground, get a different reading. Push it down two inches, different reading. All of a sudden, you can look and see at two inches what's, what's available, at four inches what's available, at six inches what's available. You can watch the nutrients proceed downward through the soil after a big rain you can see that there's less availability in the middle of the bed than there is in the pathway. Or you can check the outside and the, you know, the lawn versus the, versus the garden. You can all of a sudden you begin to see and you look and you notice the visual growth, you know, symptomology that's subtle that you wouldn't otherwise necessarily have noticed. You can monitor with this conductivity meter. It's a really interesting and valuable tool if you use it. Um, <clears throat> if you're the kind of person who uses tools. Not everybody is. If you're not that kind of person, don't worry about it. But <clears throat> the point I want to make in, in, in um, largely is that it's really important to me to have good conductivity in the soil when I put my seedlings in the ground or my seeds in the ground. I do not want to put my seeds in the ground with low conductivity. Um, so I'm going to give you now a recipe for actually building soil conductivity. This is what I use. Yes? This, then, this tool then teaches you how to read the plants? Um, it's a really valuable way to begin the process of noticing. Um, I'm not sure people have noticed, you know, oftentimes in my experience, the middle of the bed, things will be a little bit yellower. They won't grow quite as well as things on the edge of the bed. Um, if you look down the whole field, you'll see areas where things are growing a little bit more well, a little bit less well. You can begin to pattern, you can notice the patterns. Um, it just helps, helps you notice nuances, I think. It's not critical, um, but um, it's good. It's good to help and see, you know, if you're going to be putting something down, how much is how much is is too much, how much is enough. Um, um, yeah, I think you know when you when it gets down to it, you should be able to learn. You should be able to know by by seeing without having to need tools. But the refractometer and the conductivity meter are the two basic tools I would suggest are really valuable for people who want to begin to um, establish metrics. Some people like numbers. Some people like spreadsheets. Some people like to have a graph over time of what's going on. And I, I, my understanding is this is, a, is really a sort of a valuable piece of that puzzle. So um, the point in general is what are you putting into the hole 
um, to get good biological activity um, and get good nutrient availability um, to cause roots to grow. Um, <coughs> my thought on this topic in general is that um, if I'm going to be doing a transplant, transplanting a, a, anything, a, um, I would like to be able to come through and dig up one of those seedlings 24 hours after I put it into the ground, gently reach around the root ball, not rip it up. And I want to see a fuzz of new roots reaching out from the root ball into the soil within 24 hours. If I don't see it within 48 hours, something's wrong. My plant is not feeling excited about getting into the ground. Right? A well-transplanted seedling will have a fuzz of roots reaching out from the root ball into the ground um, in very short order. That's been my experience. Um, people don't oftentimes dig up their seedlings after they put them in the ground to check and see how the transplant went. but um, we sort of walk by and say, good luck, guys, or something along those lines, I think. And nothing too much more in most cases, at least that's been my experience. Um, anyway, quickly, I want to give you a recipe for things you can put into the ground. All of these things are things you can make yourself or you can purchase. Um, I call it the planting or transplanting drench, as in things you water into the ground. Um, uh, fungal and bacterial inoculant. Um, how do you make your own inoculant? I just want to give you a quick recipe for making your own. Of course, you can buy things. Um, uh, a term to look up online would be IMO, Indigenous Microorganism, it stands for. Um, so there's you know, lots and lots of articles and chapters and books and things on IMOs. Um, but the quick and dirty is that you are obliged to go for a walk. Um, anybody? Ever feel obliged to go for a walk or wish they were obliged to go for a walk or sacrifice their walk because they have other things they have to do? Um, in, in this case, you're obliged to go for a walk. You can call it, you know, farm time. It's a, you know, it's legitimate. Like, I'm working, honey. Sorry, not available. Um, I have to go and go for a walk. Uh, what you need to do is you need to bring a bucket or a, a bag, and the objective is to hit as many microclimates as possible. Um, you want to hit field edges. You want to hit meadow, stream, forest, um, um, marsh. You're looking for plants that have shiny leaves. Um, we talked about shiny leaves yesterday and the fungal. I'm sorry, the, 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 the um, fat uh, levels. So <clears throat> the idea is that when you've got shiny leaves, you've got plants that are healthy. When you've got plants that are healthy, that means they're, feeding, they're being fed well. If they're being fed well, they've got good gut flora. So wherever you see a shiny leaf, you can know that the biology is functioning well. And so what you do is you just reach down anywhere you see a, a shiny leaf and pick up a handful of soil from underneath that plant. You want to hit as many different microclimates as possible, hit as many different types of plants as possible, trees, herbs, shrubs, annuals, weeds, um, moss. Uh, where I live right now, we've got um, skunk cabbage just coming up in the springtime. You know, skunk cabbage comes up in the, wet, in the wetland. It almost always has a really nice shiny leaf. Like, there is some biology in skunk cabbage roots that, help, that functions really well at a low temperature, right? It's, it's, that's good stuff. You want to get that and you want to have it available in the springtime when you're putting your seedlings into the ground into cold soil because they can use that biology to help feed themselves when the soil is cold. So moss, um, uh, lichen, um, you know, lamb's quarters, goldenrod, I mean just um, sumac, just a, as broad a spectrum as possible. You want to be reaching down any of those plants that look shiny right now, get a handful of that soil, put it in a bag and go back home or in a bucket. Um, um, generally, you know, I've said this before, when you put water into, bi when you put biology into water, I like to say you've got about four hours until it's dead. Um, if it's alive, it, and it's aerobic, it'll breathe the oxygen out of the water, and then once all the oxygen is breathed out of the water, it'll die. So um, you really don't want to keep it in there for any longer than you need to, which means basically you've got your bucket of soil, it's the evening, you want to go to, you know, bed, fine, that's fine, no problem. Don't put the water in until the morning when you're ready to transplant. But put the water in a bucket, stir it up, and then pour that into your, uh, however you are going to be irrigating or watering into the, into the soil. Um, <clears throat> you can use a, I use a 55 gallon drum with a, a sump pump and a hose. Um, I'll put my inoculant in there, I'll put my other ingredients in there, and I'll literally go with my hose and water every hole or water the row. If you've got an irrigation system and you've got drip tape and you've made your rows and you can just, you know, you've got a fertilizer injector, you can put it through the fertilizer injector. If you've got a water wheel transplanter, you can put this in the water wheel transplanter and water it into the rows when you're transplanting. But very simply, you can harvest biology from the environment and 
integrated into an irrigation or you know uh, uh, a fertigation system um, to inoculate the soil around your, your root ball. Um, if you want to make a foliar inoculant, if you want to make an inoculant for the foliage, you ex go through the exact same process except you take those shiny leaves off the plants instead of the soil from underneath them. Put those leaves in your bag or your, bu or your bucket. <coughs> when you get home, you cover that bucket with water, uh, cover the leaves with water, scrunch them all up, put it in a backpack sprayer and you can go out and spray that onto the leaves of your plants and you've harvested biology from the environment and you can um, spray it onto your plants. Yes? I came in late, so you may have covered this already, but what do you think of the, like, the whole the rice method? Um, the Korean natural farming thing where you're going to be you, um, meat culturing and the culturing. And, IMO? Uh, it feels like a lot of work to me. Um, you just use some old I haven't you tried take it. You take out like, the little mm -hmm. aluminum thing they get and you go for your walk and put it in that to put a cardboard cover on it. Like, you say <laughs> Mexican takeout? I mean, it happened to be um, because it was the only collection vessel that I had. I carried the soil out of the forest with me and I like threw it as Mexican takeout thing and it was rice and cheese and <laughs> oils. Mm -hmm. The fungal foods, and I was having a workshop, so I put it, the lid on it, and then it like it just exploded. So I learned about the Korean natural <laughs> farming. I was like, oh, that happened to me. Oh, <laughs> but it's a lot different. Oh, it was know, Mexican natural farming, yes. You can throw it in your. We threw it in the brewer and extracted it. But, uh, it was like a pre-treat. It's the pre-treat. Yeah. yeah, you can you can reproduce them in that kind of a manner if you want to. Um, mm -hmm. I think if you're obliged to go for a walk every so often, it's not the end of the world. So you said that you just take the handfuls and put them in water and you don't aerate it or anything? Uh, if you're going to be using it right away, no. You just you put them in there, stir it up, and basically all the people in the soil are going to be floating around in the water and you pour that into your irrigation right. system. Cool. I mean, it can be that simple. Yeah. Look up IMO, look up career natural farming. There's all kinds of techniques online that are delineated in much greater detail. There's books about this kind of stuff. I want to give you a simple, like, conceptual idea of what's possible and then, you know, knock yourself out. Um, you know, even though it's nice to go for walks, um, some people don't get around to going for walks. And so having some dry inoculant on hand that you can use uh, in a pinch, I think, is not necessarily a bad idea. Um, you can mix your inoculant you've harvested with the inoculant you've purchased if you want. The idea of inoculation is still critically important. Um, okay. <clears throat> if you want to make enzymes, you can take that leaf tea, the, the, you know, those leaves you've harvested, or you can take leaves from, you know, if you're pruning tomato plants or you're, or you're pulling weeds, you, you know, fill a bucket full of leaves, cover it with water, and put a lid on it and let it sit for, I think, about six weeks, four to six weeks. Um, you need the pH strip, and once the pH in that water has gone below four and a half, you've got a, a stable anaerobic ferment full of uh, enzymes that can be decanted. You take it, pour it into a you know a one gallon jug, put it in the basement, and it'll be shelf stable till next year. You can use it. I like to put a few glugs of enzymes as well into my um, you know transplanting water along with the inoculant. It's and one the of I called that inoculant. Uh, IMO, indigenous microorganism, is the indigenous microorganisms is the sort of a general term you can search for online to get way more information than you need. Um, IMO, yeah. Indigenous is a word that means found natively. Yes, precisely. So it's the microorganisms that are that are naturally occurring in your local environment, which. Uh, may be present in the forest and the swamps, but are not present in your field because your field had, you know, corn grown on it for 30 years, and it, along with that corn, a bunch of chemicals are applied, and the life that was present is no longer present, and so you need to reestablish it. So going to the edge of the woods would be the best place to go. Would be going that way. Field edges, swamps, you know, meadows, marshes, forests. <coughs> Exactly. Those kind of areas are where you're going to have, where you've got more species of plants growing, where you've got less disturbance. Um, it's where you're going to have more biological activity. And you can basically go and harvest from there to re-inoculate the areas where things have been disturbed. If you're in like a state park and there's like a nice old rotting log, you see a lot of good fungal strands on, like you yeah. can just get some of that. I have a bunch of that in my back, in my back for yeah. that would be good. Just go out there, leaf duff. Mm -hmm. Put in your compost Yeah. You can harvest. These guys are everywhere. They're everywhere. Yeah. My mulch pile sat over the winter, and in the, in the end of uh, March, it erupted in mushrooms. Yeah. I thought I would deploy some of this mulch, and I went out and 
put my hand toward it like I was going to pick up a handful mm -hmm. of it and it's like a huge cake. Yeah. It is all completely bound up with uh, Marcelia. Mar yeah. I see. Yeah. I have a picture of it and it is beautiful. Broke it open and it's almost white. Beautiful. So what do you do with that? Use it. Celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> Pour yourself a glass of wine. Okay, job well done. Yeah. Use some to inoculate all What's your that? Your bed. Um, not done yet. You stop asking questions, I'll finish. Keep asking questions, we won't get done. Soil conductivity boost, the IMO I'm not there yet. You can see the ingredient list has only gotten halfway through. If you read the handout and just have a little bit of patience, I may be going somewhere and have done this a few times. I'll stop engaging questions from people who ask too many. Two. Pages like three through eight go like, they disappear. Um, all right, uh, so we did uh, inoculation and enzymes. Uh, sea minerals is the next one. We've talked about sea minerals a number of times here today and yesterday. Um, I made reference to the fact that seawater has um, this broadest <coughs> spectrum of elements of any naturally occurring material. Luckily, the planet is covered two-thirds, I think, of the planet is covered with seawater, so we have plenty of seawater to work with. Um, um, the issue with seawater, if there is one, is that it is the minerals in it are primarily sodium chloride, and people know about sodium chloride, and it's something you don't want to be having too much of. Some is good, too much is not good. Um, there's a really, really simple process by which you can remove the sodium chloride from seawater and just get the trace elements and not the sodium chloride. And it re involves, again, you are obliged to go to the beach. Uh, you must stay there overnight. You are obliged to go camping at the beach. So this is a, a farm. Um, responsibility. Um, this is a you know tax write-off for your mileage. Um, you are on staff time. Um, you must bring. Uh, I would suggest a 55-gallon drum and a five-gallon bucket. Um, you take your 55-gallon drum and you set it up above the high tide line. Take a five-gallon bucket and fill the drum up with seawater. Um, the only things you, other, you need are lye and a and a stick um, and a pH strip. Um, you will be adding lye to the seawater in the, in the drum, in the barrel, until the pH goes above, I think it's 10.4. Um, once the pH is above 10.4, uh, you, you basically stir the lye in with a stick. You probably want to use a plastic barrel, not a metal barrel, because lye eats metal. Um, and once the pH is up to 10.4, you, uh, you stop stirring and let it be. You have to go camping, come back 24 hours later, um, and you should find a milky fluid at the bottom of the barrel. Uh, milky color. In this case, the cream is falling to the bottom, not rising to the top. And you need to uh, <coughs> siphon off the clear water off the top. That's your sodium chloride water. And the milky fluid at the bottom is your trace element rich concentrate. Now, you basically just precipitated out the trace elements from the sodium chloride. It's as simple as adding lye. Um, nothing else is needed. You can buy sea salt in 50 pound bags or one ton, one ton totes, and you can make it um, by adding water to your sea salt if you want. You don't have to go to the ocean. but it's a good excuse to go to the ocean. You still take the um, sodium chloride out when you reconstitute salt? If you want to, when you have added water to sea salt, take the sodium chloride out. This is how you would do it. Um, um, I, when I'm spreading my 75 pounds of sea salt per acre on the land as an annual, as an annual prophylactic dose, I don't do anything. I just spread the dry sea salt. But for those who are concerned about uh, sodium chloride, um, if they want just the trace elements and not the sodium chloride, they're concerned about seawater, this is a way you can easily precipitate the sodium chloride out. Um, I have talked in many workshops about the value of, of seawater. Um, I've got a couple of friends or a couple of people who've taken the course who um, I thought I was very clear but didn't listen to me. And um, there's one guy I know who's a wonderful Portuguese guy. And um, every year he brings me, you know, this four pound tomato or two and like a 50 pound winter squash. And um, he didn't hear my directions. And uh, he adds a gallon of seawater to every barrel of irrigation water. He has a little backyard garden. And so um, I've said when you're putting together a foliar spray, you want to have a 2% concentration. So that's you know, um, 
quarter cup per gallon or two cups, two, two gallons per 100 gallons. He, has, he goes to the ocean, gets a 55 gallon drum of seawater and puts a gallon of seawater into every barrel of irrigation water and his plants are ridiculous. Absolutely crazy. He is always watering his plants with a dilute concentrate of seawater every single time he waters his plants. It's amazing and they do ridiculous things. So get stinky because I try to bring the ocean water home. Mm -hmm. you know, it can be a little bit funky. Yeah. And it does, it's not bad. It's just the I don't think it's bad. I don't know. Microanaerobic. There's a lot of life in seawater. People yeah. might not know this, but seawater is absolutely chock full of life. Chock full of life. Um, anyway, uh, the idea here is basically that you can precipitate that, that out if you want to. Um, a gallon or two of this concentrate per acre would be what the quantities you're looking at when you're talking about uh, you know, watering things into the ground for, um, for planting and transplanting. You know, as many as 10 gallons of this concentrate per acre, you know, over the year watered into the irrigation system, applied through foliar application would be a pretty heavy dose. Um, I've seen people use this kind of stuff um, and get really remarkable results on their plants. Um, I, I know all the stories about salt and salt being toxic and salt being bad, and I've also been on farms where people have pushed it with seawater and, um, and I've seen amazing things happen. So I don't know um, enough to say much about it except that this is how it works. This is what I've seen um, and this is a really simple way to remove the sodium chloride and get just sort of the trace elements quickly. My soil is low sodium. Yes. Is this a solution? Absolutely. Um, um, micronized calcium, phosphorus, and traces. Um, my understanding is that uh, root development uh, requires good levels of phosphorus and good levels of calcium. Um, and in many cases, especially cold spring soils, phosphorus is poorly available, calcium is sluggish, and root development is um, insufficient. So uh, the simplest way to get uh, um, good levels of calcium and phosphorus is to uh, cal is to calphos or colloidal rock phosphate. Uh, you may be familiar with the brown paper bags. They say 030 on them, CalFOS, Florida, Florida colloidal rock phosphate. Um, if you take that, colloidal means basically very, very small particle size. Um, you can take a couple pounds of, of CalFOS, put it in a five gallon bucket of water, stir it up, come back 12 hours later and that water will still be cloudy because the particle size is so small that it's still standing in suspension. Um, if you put that into your um, transplant water with the seawater, with the uh, inoculant, you've got a bunch of critical ingredients necessary for good root development. Like I said, when you transplant, you would like to see uh, 24 hours later, you'd like to be able to dig up, dig up a seedling and see that, that fuzz of new roots reaching out from the root ball into the soil. Um, and the conductivity uh, really comes from the, from the uh, sea minerals in this case. Uh, whenever I'm adding a salt, ever, period, full end of story, I always like to put in a, a buffering carbon source. Um, molasses is possible. I generally use uh, humates at least um, a little bit. Um, um, <clears throat> so the traces actually come, you have good traces levels from, from rock phosphate. Rock phosphate has about 40 high or 50 trace elements in it, similar to azomite, um, the calphos does. Um, humates have good trace elements in them, um, absolutely. So what I do is after I made my hole, tested my conductivity, I will you know add enough of this drench to bring the conductivity up to about 150. That's a good that's my baseline. Um, um, uh, in many cases, farmers who transplant seedlings have this uh, process where they take the uh, tray of seedlings and they dunk it in a mix of liquid fish or kelp. Maybe they'll have it in a in a, um, a water trough for cows or something like that. Um, and they do that because they want to make sure there's a good nutrient pack in the soil when they put the transplants into the ground. Um, my thought is that when you put a bunch of nutrients in the root ball and put it into ground that doesn't have, not, doesn't have a hell of a lot in it necessarily, that the roots have every reason to go this way and not that way. So my thought is you should be putting the nutrients into the soil and then putting the root ball into the soil afterwards so they have every reason to reach out. Um, whether you water the hole first or put the seedlings into the hole and then water around it, I don't necessarily care too much. But the idea is that you'd like the roots to have a really strong incentive to reach out, not reach in. <coughs> um, generally, once I've, I've done this transplanting um, process, I will uh, put my drip tape down um, and then mulch. And then I'm pretty much done for the year. Um, there's very little left to do. Um, What's that? Harvest. Harvest. Yes, exactly. Um, I, I, I say this, you know, to not necessarily tongue in cheek, but um, 
I don't like being out in the beating down sun all day in July or even the end of June. Um, it wears on you. Anybody? Yeah. Spent enough days out in the beating down sun in high summer and felt like that whole sunstroke thing and the just yeah. like drained like by the middle of July, you're just, you're just hanging, dragging. By the beginning of August, you're like, why am, why am I a farmer? Um, what I do in the end of June through July is I go swimming back in this ponds in the stream in the forest um, where I want to be, right? The heat in the summer, you want to be in water. So you walk out back and, you know, hang out in the stream. Um, uh, when the plants are in the ground growing well, their soil is covered with mulch, the weeds can't see the sunlight, um, they don't germinate, they don't grow. Um, it's real easy. Uh, mulching the soil heavily is something I'm a big fan of. People may have heard of um, uh, Ruth Stout. Have you heard of Ruth Stout? Um, big fan of mulch. Um, I'm a big fan of mulch. I think the, the uh, it's just, it really does simplify the whole process. It feeds the soil life. It keeps um, the, you know, uh, water in the soil. It builds organic matter. It keeps the soil life fed. It's, there's just uh, so many reasons to, to mulch. I use old round bales of hay. I get them for 25 bucks a piece. And it doesn't take many round bales um, to really have just a, a deep, Deep layer of mulch in the garden. Is there a question? Yeah. Do you feel like with the round bales that you struggle with uh, importing weeds or grass? Yeah, everybody says that. Um, <clears throat> my experience or my understanding is that for starters, my field, which is now cropland, was a hay field for a long time. And so there's been probably centuries of hay seeds dropped on that ground already. So a little more among friends is absolutely nothing. Um, the other thing is that when <clears throat> you've got earthworms present at high levels, my understanding is that they actually digest most of the soil a few times going through the growing season, and part of what they digest are, are seeds. So they're actually eating the weed seeds or hay seeds. And also that if the hay is thick enough, any seeds that germinate on the ground can't see sunlight. Any seeds that germinate that are still on the stem don't have access to soil and you have very, very little actual weed germination, hay germination, and grass weeds growing. Either way, <clears throat> um, I don't think it's a problem to have green plants growing around my crops. We just talked about spacing and, you know, like I put my brassicas three feet on center, you know, kale, uh, you know, collards, uh, bro broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, um, they like a good two and a half, three feet. That's what they would like as far as space. And so if there's something growing in between them, until it gets tall and shades them out, I don't think it's a problem. But even when it does start to get tall, I rip its head off and lay it down and call it mulch. So I don't really have a problem with things growing up here and there, which is all you're really going to get because of the logistics of the situation. Um, yeah. Do you think that you have any percent risk of uh, it making excesses when you're adding lots of mulch? What kind of excesses? Uh, uh, potassium or I've heard about potassium excesses out west um, from organic matter. But I think the soils are generally high in potassium in general. Um, no. <clears throat> no. Um, I mean, as I understand, if you actually do a assay of your soil, you'll find, you know, thousands and thousands of pounds of potassium actually present in the soil. Um, so a little bit more is not necessarily... Um, a bit. You know, it's not going to imbalance the system. What shows up on the soil test is, a, is, a, is some of what's available. Um, it's what's available, but there's a whole bunch more in reserve. Um, this is not like soluble potassium. This is, it's potassium in an organic cons construct. And my understanding is it's not um, taken up by the plant if it's not needed. So it's not necessarily an issue. Um, not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of. No. Yes? Do you, do you have a way to make sure that that hay has not been treated with something that's going to kill the plants that you put it on? Absolutely. Um, I pay close attention to what my neighbors are up to, and I only get hay from people who don't put anything on the hay fields. Generally what goes on where I'm from is that um, there's not a lot of farming left, but there are a bunch of hay fields mm -hmm. left, and the people who own the hay fields aren't farmers, um, and there are farmers who hay the fields for them, and uh, the farmers who hay the fields for them don't have any interest in putting any money into the land. so. The last thing they're going to do is put any fertilizer or any sprays on. They're using that hay as feed for their cows, pretty much, uh, in the winter. 
and some bales get rained on or don't get eaten, and that's what I get. So, um, yeah, it, I know it's not that this way in other parts of the country necessarily, but there's uh, almost nothing put on to the hayfield ground. Um, and I know that my neighbors that I'm, that I'm getting hay from, I know they don't put anything down. So, yeah. The discussions that we had about this at several meetings I've been to, where everyone was afraid to buy hay to use for mulch, buy straw to use for mulch because you can put pesticide in the garden and do all this other stuff. But it's my, from my understanding that we don't really put pesticides and things on hay. <coughs> That's not typical. Uh, it's not, not typical for hay. I'll sometimes I'll out for barley and for straw. Straw. straw sometimes herbicide will be put on to kill right. the other weeds. Mm -hmm. So, um, so you have. So if you're buying straw, which is generally very expensive, um, then you get, may have an issue. I know some friends who have an organic farm got bedding from a horse place, and they, you know composted it and put it on the tomatoes and all the tomatoes were totally tweaked out because there was an herbicide right. on the straw that made it through the compost pile that caused them to almost lose their certification. Um, but yes. Good old I wouldn't say that's necessarily true. Our yeah. our neighbors won't sell us hay specifically because they spray grays on. It's a broadleaf herbicide. It's a broadleaf herbicide. A lot of people use it. It's 240. It's quite well. Orange. As with anything, I'll say this again. I said it yesterday. Anything you're bringing onto your farm, talk, figure out where it came from, what the story is. People aren't usually going to lie about it. People are honest. They'll tell you the truth. Most people don't think that these chemicals are like. But all you have to do is ask them. I ask them. I said I'm really organic. We don't use any chemicals. We don't use any herbicides. Sometimes the guys will say no, and I only do because I stay on the phone in another 15, 20 minutes or on a second call, I ask them again. I've been told no, gotten hay, and then later they said, oh, it had grays on. But yeah. they don't think it's a chemical or an herbicide. Like, I've had even people that work for my family who were the farm manager be like, we don't use any chemicals. Yeah. And they're using atrazine, semazine, 240, you know. Buckets. We don't use any, any yeah, I got, there's an organic well, farmer well, in the next well, couple towns over who does field work <laughs> for other people. They're, they're not trying to lie. Yeah. And that's really the he, doesn't, he doesn't use anything except he uses Roundup for the edges of the fields. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. So ask and have a relationship. Just kind of softly approach it. It's a relationship. It's a relationship. I know some of the brand names because they do know the brand names. Like, or just say, what did you put on? You know, you know, just stress to them that you're just trying to, so important for you as a grower. Like. I usually, even though I'm not organically certified, I say I'm organically certified. I can lose my certification. You know, clients who are organically certified, so I'm sourcing it. So if you kind of make it a big deal, then they might pay a little more attention to. I know question. my I know my farmer, and I know that there's only once or twice a year when he's out in the field. Like I can see the fields where he's mowing. I know if what he, he does. He comes to mow, and then he teds, and then he bales, yep. and then you don't see him until it comes again. There is nothing going on. There's a on. lot of land like that. So There's a lot of land like that. So just to talk to the farmers and figure it out. But yes, a very important point. Thank you for bringing it up. Yes. Lysa Face has a, has, has a half-life of 22 years, I yes. think. Yes, absolutely. Roundup, it's called, the technical name for it is glyphosate. It is a trace element chelator. The way it works is by tying up manganese, copper, zinc, <clears throat> cobalt. Um, that's how it technically works. It pulls those trace elements out of the plant. They're critical for, tra for enzyme system function, and it basically kills the plant by making it not able to function, by, by tying those things up. Compounding the problem <clears throat> is that this product was developed I'm sorry. As, a, 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 as a bacterial killer and not a... And that's why we've got all these problems with people's gut flora and all the, you know, <clears throat> what's wrong with the kids these days? The <laughs> autism. <laughs> Direct correlation between autism and and the our gut floors being off and our and the, these trace elements being tied up. It's brilliant. The people from the science at MIT. It is absolutely directly correlated, categorically. End of story. Yes. <coughs> We're gonna die if we don't figure this out. It's the way life works. If we don't figure out how to do something about it, if we don't figure out how to change the situation, we're dead. Those of us who do figure it out are going to stay alive. Those of us who don't are going to be dead. Nature available. figures this thing out. Nature has rules for how this works. There is a material available now to get it out of your body. Let me ask a question. Answer it when and, when and if it fits. Yes. 
how do we, what's the message we send to, not us, but to our customers, to cause them to change their behavior and put value on better quality food that looks the same as the store when they don't yet understand? They have money for data plans, they've got money for this and for that, but not this is for food. Part of the systemic work of the organization is putting together this rhetoric into forms that are readily available. Um, for me, the question is one of uh, flavor. It's a conversation. You can't use one-liners. You can't. It's not about a quick, you know, little bumper sticker. It's about conversations and relationships. I'm not a big fan of the, you know, the the the, the short, um, you know, fattest kind of um, shtick. I'm a fan of relationships and conversations and understanding. And um, you know, you begin to have conversations. I used to be very evangelical, evangelical about this kind of stuff. I used to try to tell everybody. I'm like, oh my God, do you understand? Well, the blah, blah, blah. Guess what happens when you push against people? They push back. They don't, they, so I, yeah, either way, it doesn't work. So if my perspective is, you know, if there are people who are curious, I'll talk to them. If there are people who are not, they have no idea what I do with my life. They have no idea what I'm up to. I try to be a good citizen. I try to be a good father, you know, and I, I try to lead, lead, lead a good life. And my experience has been that people are curious. People who are curious are receptive, and those are the ones I, try, I, I talk to. And they get excited, and they try to tell everybody, and then they realize that most people aren't, don't care. <laughs> Some people do, and you share with them. And we, it has to, it's word of mouth, it's relationships, it's organic, it's a, that fungal you know, mycelial web of networks. It's, it's a conversation. It's a conversation and a relationship. It's not a, a pitch. Um, um, and the more well we can organize the content and the, and the facts, um, you know, we will hopefully have some short videos that can be downloaded and forwarded and Facebooked and all that kind of stuff. Um, but step by step, yeah. All right, so plant visual analysis is our next major section here. Um, it comes in a few different uh, components. Um, um, I'll just start here with the, at the beginning assessing plant status. Um, <clears throat> um, I like to, when I'm going out to the field, um, not just go out and start doing what I'm planning on doing, but to go out and, and on the way, as I get close to the edge, stop and say, hey guys, how you doing? I'm opening up my hoop house. Hey guys, <laughs> anybody ever been hit by a, yeah. like a wind of like, hey, yeah. good morning, <laughs> how's it going? Like there's this intense like force of like ebullience that comes out of the hoop house if you're not careful, it'll hit you. Like it's like a wind that hits you. I felt that some people know what I'm talking about. Um, if you know how to read body language, I'll suggest, you know how to read plant language. You have human body language, animal body language, plant body language. Ugh. Oh, feeling poor. Mm, feeling oh, right? Look at the plants. How do they feel? What's their body language? What's their, what's their, you know, physiological shape? Um, just silently, without embarrassing yourself without telling anybody what you're up to in your mind in your heart say how's it going what's up and you don't need to sit there and wait for an answer to come to you just go about your day go about doing what you're doing I have this experience in my life where um, I'll go out there I'll be doing whatever I'm doing I'll be picking I'll be tying I'll be mulching I'll be weeding and I'll get into this like there'll be this like lyric from a song that'll get into my head and it'll be like this beat, it's like a groove, like and I'll be grooving away, right? I'll just like this lyric will come and start just repeating itself in my head like a, you know, what do they call those things? Um, mantra. <clears throat> and five minutes into it or ten minutes into it, I'll just like, I'll actually look at the lyric instead of just repeating it over and over again, I'll like, what are the words in the sentence? And so often those words have some really interesting connection to what I'm doing or what I maybe should be doing for these, pe for these people, for these plants. Like, I, that's how I feel it. That's how I get it, is the words will come and it'll be through something that I'm not, I don't listen to music very much. I don't know a lot of songs, but there'll be like these random things that come to me. Uh, or I'll be just working along and my mind will be, you know, going wherever it goes and I'll be meditating on the topic of whatever, you know. I'll, be, I'll just begin to think and like I'll, I'll be having all these thoughts and I'm not really aware of what I'm thinking about. But my mind will be sort of traveling around this general topic. I find it happens when I'm busy doing something. Sometimes my mind goes 
Yes. Have you read Stephen Buhner's the, like the Lost Language of Plants? Um, yes. I'm reading that right now. Brilliant. This is really I'm talking about the antenna yeah. systems uh, yeah. in a little bit. Yes, absolutely. Buhner is absolutely on it. Totally on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and we can talk about that right now. We'll just bring up Buhner. Um, <clears throat> but uh, it fits later in the agenda, but it also fits here, interestingly. Um, I don't have a TV in my house. Um, I grew up with no TV. Um, I know when my kids get access to a screen, you see them like, yeah. just like totally, like, that's what I'm like too. Like you get a TV, turn it on, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> In a restaurant, I'm like, <laughs> I should be having a conversation with you, but I'm totally fixated on nothing of consequence. Um, every now and then, uh, like, you know, the Patriots are in the Super Bowl or the Red Sox are in the whatever playoffs or something. And, you know, I like to go to the bar and watch it. I like to watch the game and I don't have a TV, so I go to the bar to watch the game, right? So um, <clears throat> if I was to go to the bar and say, um, I was talking to the divas of my tomato plants today and they were telling me, um, you know, poof, out the bar you go. Um, <laughs> if I said I had a gut feeling about something, you're like, oh, what was it? You know what gut feeling is, right? We know what divas are, mm -hmm. you know, intuition. Right? We've got some woo-woo kind of words that some people use and feel comfortable with. And we've got other non-woo-woo words that some people use and feel comfortable with. And my understanding is they're exactly this. They mean the same thing. They come from the same place. We've got different languages for the diff for the same thing. Um, um, and this gut feeling thing, I mean, maybe I should just talk about it now for a second. Although it's, I have to explain the whole thing to properly explain it. And I'll, 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 get, I'll get to it. Um, so whether you, you know, think you're, you know, talking to the divas, or whether you're, you're using your intuition, or whether you're just having gut feelings, I don't really care what your words are. But for me, it's about that realm of things. It's about engaging on that level and being receptive to these things that come to you. and being curious and not sort of discounting things out of hand, but actually being present with what's going on. And you don't need to trust it necessarily, but just if you're thinking about something, try it out and see what happens. Um, my wife will ask me, you know, what's going on today? Uh, what are you, what are you, what are you, what's your plans for the day? And I'm like, I don't know yet. I'm going to go for a walk and I can tell you. Um, like, I don't know what I'm doing today until, I mean, I know I have to pick. It's Thursday, I have to pick. Okay, fine, I'm going to be picking. But, um, like, which job of the 18 jobs that could be done am I doing today? I don't know. I'll go for a walk, and, I'll, and it'll come to me. It'll, uh, it'll be obvious to me. I've gotten to a point where I can just look and I can see. I can feel like, okay, these guys are ready for this. And there's no obvious thing to it, but it's, it's one of those, it comes with time and experience. And I think a lot of people here are nodding to see you nodding and you know what I'm talking about. So, um, you know, from that sort of perspective, I want to give a bunch of really specific f physical, physiologically sim symptoms that you can use to build your awareness if you're looking for that um, skill set. Um, but understand, it's really, from my perspective, all coming from this perspective, this mode of sensitivity and intuition and what, and, and you know, how the spirit is speaking to you, whatever the language is that works for you, I don't really care. Um, but you know, try not to judge other people who are trying to say the same thing, but have different words for it. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to run through a bunch of, of symptomology here for the next few minutes. Are the new growth tips standing erect? The new leaves, the new buds, are they like turgid and like vigorous and full of energy, especially in the morning, or are they kind of just hanging flaccidly? Um, um, do honeybees work the flowers or pollinators if things are flowering? Um, you may notice that at some points the uh, honeybees will be fighting over the squash blossoms, and at other points they blow right by the squash yeah. blossoms and are heading for the clover. Right? Honeybees, it's really important to them the quality of the pollen. If the pollen is of low quality, it takes more energy to turn it into honey than they get from it later in the winter, and so it's a, it's a net loss. They can tell whether the pollen is worth harvesting or not, and that correlates with the health of the plant. So if you can see the honeybees are ignoring your, your, your plants, <coughs> or pollinators in general, that's a good sign. Those plants are on the down, you know, hill side of things. Um, you won't necessarily be able to see it because you can't notice with such subtlety or you don't have learned to yet, um, or remembered to. Um, but if you watch how nature responds to things, you can get clues sometimes um, f 
for when we, when we can't. Is the plant growing rapidly? Do you see regular, regular growth or not? What weed families are dominant? Are you seeing the quack grasses and the rhizomy grasses? Or are you seeing the broadleaf weeds like pigweeds and lamb's quarters? Can you see the pattern? There's a bunch of these guys over here and a bunch of these guys over there. What did I do differently? What has happened differently that has caused these to grow here and not here? Look back, remember what happened historically in the past month, in the past two weeks, in the past year, and see if you can identify what the things are that happened that are now causing nature to respond by growing these weeds here and those weeds there. Um, how many flowers are setting per bunch? Are you getting four or five flowers per cluster? Or are you getting one or two flowers per cluster? You may have noticed with tomato plants as an example that you start off the growing season with four or five flowers per cluster, generally at the bottom of the plant, and then it proceeds to three to four, and then it goes to two to three, and then it goes to one to two. Can we notice that? By the middle of August, your tomato plants are only setting one or two flowers per cluster. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. If you get to that point, it went from four to five to one to two, and it proceeded from in that trajectory, and you didn't notice. Right? You weren't watching to see that the numbers of flowers was decreasing. Why? What was the cause of that? What correlates with flower, you know, flowering? We don't, we don't notice these things. We don't notice the subtleties as they move and evolve over time. Um, I was talking about the conductivity meter reading here. Uh, I'll talk about the bricks reading later. Um, I like to say, I mean, maybe it's not the same way it is, same way down here as up where I come from, but where I come from, not many people go to church. Right? There's a bunch of these big old beautiful churches in the center of town, and there's not many people in them. Right? Sunday morning is, is not a lot of people in church. And I say, um, you know, taking an hour off a week to commune with the divine, is I don't think it's a bad idea at all. Um, and if you don't want to go to church, that's fine with me. I don't care where you go. But if you want to take an hour off every week and have it be a sacred time when you're going to go out and commune with nature and be present with your plants, I think that might not be a bad idea at all. Just call it Tuesday mornings at 7, call it whenever you want, but go out and spend some time and be present and watch and notice week, one week, next week, next week, and really engage the process of being present. Step aside, don't just do it a little bit here and a little bit there, but formally set aside a time of being present and watching and noticing and feeling and, and being receptive and communing with what's going on around you. Um, uh, my experience is that people who do that learn an amazing amount in a year an amazing amount in a year if you have a regular practice of going out and actively looking and noticing and, and discerning all these nuances that you wouldn't otherwise necessarily see. Um, I tell stories about these people in the city. I think I made references to it yesterday um, in New York on the rooftop gardens who you know, are so proud of their rooftop mm -hmm. garden and how they call themselves urban farmers. And um, I, you know, I, was, I was down there giving a lecture and, and I heard about this, this group and I went up on the roof and the tomato plants looked horrible. They were these like little, like just like, they, would, they were purple and their leaves were small and they were like, they were like just like, and they were so proud of their tomato plants. They were so like, look, we're farmers. I'm like, look at your plants. I didn't say anything. I was trying to be polite, but like, we don't look at our plants. We don't know what healthy looks like. We had this late light come through a few years ago, and everybody said, my tomatoes are so healthy. And then they were dead. I know. If they were so healthy, then they wouldn't have been dead. <laughs> they weren't healthy, but you don't know what you're looking at. Yes. If you know what you're looking at, you can see the signs of dis-ease long before it turns into something deadly. Right? We can do this with humans. We know with humans, we can look at them and see, you've lost your color. You, your coat is not as shiny as it used to be, right? Your skin is not the right color. Right? We know these subtleties. We know how to read them in humans. We know how to read them in animals sometimes. We, we can easily read them in plants if we learn to look with that kind of an eye. <clears throat> how thick are the stems? How thick are the calyxes? How thick are the leaves? What color are the leaves? What color is the sap? Um, spacing between the nodes, petals on each flower. Uh, there's so many wonderful little, little pieces here. Color of the sap, this is a wonderful one. I'm not sure. Um, do you mind getting me one of those leaves from the back when you're back there? Thank you. <clears throat> really, really simple process. Um, this is a uh, modified vice grips, obviously. It's a vice grip with <laughs> two pieces of metal um, welded onto it. If you join the organization as a participant, you get this and the refractometer and the little chart. Um, but you can take just this outside and you can look at uh, plants and you can discern uh, how they're doing look at this. Um, by squishing a leaf and just looking at the sap that comes out. So you want to see something that's really dark, um, so dark 
green in color, that it's almost black. See, that's not a dark green color, right? It's definitely green, which sometimes it's not, and it's watery. What you'd like to see is something that's actually um, dark, so dark that it's almost black, and it's so viscous that you can, you know, put a drop between your, your thumb and forefinger, and you can pull your finger apart, and it'll be like, it'll be sticky. And that's the consistency of sap that you want. And then, of course, you can taste it. It's like, it's not sweet. It's very marginal. Yeah, you look at the color of the leaf. You can <laughs> tell where the color of the leaf is not. Well, but it's a different kind, too, but it's still not. Yeah. It's been very yeah. So, you know, correlate your, your physical experiences, your, your, you know, taste, your sight, your, you know, aesthetics of, of, of structure, your conductivity. When you begin to, mo to monitor these things in order, in relationship to each other, you can get to a point where you look at them and say, eh, right? Um, and then ideally we'll talk in a minute about specific minerals and their correlations with specific symptomology. Um, and you can say, oh, it looks like potassium to me. Um, as far as I'm concerned, this section of the course is the weakest section of the course. This wisdom that was present, I think, to a large degree in our communities and our cultures is to a large degree lost. We have some good books out there which lay it all out. Um, um, there's a, a, one of the best books out there is um, uh, Mineral Nutrition in Higher Plants. It's a, it's a college textbook. It's a grad you know, textbook. Mineral Nutrition in Higher Plants, which lays out the logistics of specific minerals, specific visual symptomology, um, et cetera. Uh, Marshner is the editor. It's a series of, a series of articles from different, different authors. Um, um, color of the leaf, you know, all the various shades of green, um, thickness of the calyx, the calyx, the stem that holds the fruit. When that stem that holds the fruit starts out, it's holding a flower. You can look at the stem and you can see how big is the fruit going to be, right? If it's a thick stem, it'll be a big fruit. If it's a thin stem, it'll be a small fruit. The plant is telling you, it's, it's, it's you know, telling you ahead of time how big the fruit's going to be if you know, if you know to look and see. Um, people may have noticed with tomatoes as an example, again, that at the beginning of the growing season, they'll oftentimes start out as big, right? Fruit, whether it's a 12-ounce fruit or a one-pound fruit. But by the end of the growing season, they get much smaller. Cherry tomatoes are the same thing. They'll start out as, you know, big, almost golf ball-sized fruit at the beginning of the year, and they'll end up marble-sized at the end of the year. Anybody notice this? Cherry tomatoes? No? They really modulate in size over time based on the environmental conditions. I remember going to our local health food store one time, and it was like September, and there were quarts of cherry tomatoes, and they were like literally marble-sized cherry tomatoes. Wow. And I was like, that was a lot of work for that three bucks. <laughs> I mean, how many marbles do you put in a quart? <laughs> it was a lot of them. Potassium, right? If you didn't know what you're looking for, if you didn't know what the cause was, you'd say, well, this is what happens every year. Every year the, the fruits get smaller. Every year this happens. Every year this happens. And you consider it to be normal. I consider it to be normal for, for potato bugs to eat the potato plants. Normal for flea beetles to eat brassicas. It's not normal to sign something being wrong. We just don't know what it is. Um, Does Marshner's book get into visual assessment? Yes. It's got lots of pictures in it. Lots of pictures in it. It's specifically, this is what copper looks like. This is what zinc looks like. This is what potassium looks like. What Different plants. A uh, horse Marshner, I think, but a Petra Marshner is the most recent. His daughter, a horse died. Um, Mineral nutrition in higher plants is the book. Is the, is all you need. You can get it on Amazon. You can totally get it on Amazon. There's versions. You know, there's editions one, two, three, four, and five. There's hard copies. There's soft yeah. copies. <laughs> get it used. I think you can get it for like forty-five or fifty bucks used. Um, and version four and version three are just fine. You don't need to get the most updated version. Um, stem strength. You should be able to a stem size. You want thicker stems. Like think about trees in the forest. Anybody ever been in a forest where there was too many trees too close together? Like oak trees, every 20 feet, and they're 50, 60 years old. They're these just like they go straight up, and they got a few branches on top. Right? That's not the structure you want. You want the structure of a big oak tree that grew up in the middle of a field. You want that big, broad, thick trunk, regular branching. You want that kind of a physiological structure. Um, stem strength. You want the stems to be able to bend without breaking. Ever, you know, walk through a zucchini, picking zucchini, and had the stems pop off and look out on the wrong way. Pop, pop. Pop, right? Summer squash, right? That's not what should happen. The stem should bend and then bend back without breaking. That that brittleness is not a sign of health. Stem hairs generally more. Stem hairs is better. Solid stems and grains and brassicas, especially, is, is entirely plausible, although uh, it does not occur regularly. Hollow stems connotes a functional calcium deficiency. 
stem shape. You'd like to have round stems, not oblong stems. You ever look at a broccoli plant, you might oftentimes find a, an oval shaped stem, not a round shaped stem. Generally, the more uh, off that stem shape is, the more uh, a calcium deficiency you're gonna be experiencing. Uh, inner node points, the space between the branches, you would like that to be closer, not farther apart. Think about you know um, cucumbers or melons or uh, summer squash or any kind of a viney, viney plant. You'll see that in some cases they get leggy and this is a long space between the branches. You'd like that to be more tight than, than far apart. Leaf thickness, thicker is better. Thinner leaves, you may notice that there's a, a broad disparity in, in leaf thickness over the growing season. Sometimes they are really nice and meaty and like a steak, and sometimes they're like papery thin. Um, <clears throat> I'm beginning to go here on the sand out to um, correlate leaf, some of these things with specific minerals. So here, leaf thickness, it says Fe, Mg, and K are associated with this. That's iron, magnesium, and potassium, who don't, those who don't remember their periodic table of the elements. What does that mean? That means that um, if you see that the leaves in your summer squash plant are getting too thin or they feel really papery thin, you can take some iron sulfate, some magnesium sulfate, and some potassium sulfate, solubilize each of them in water, and spray some on one plant, some on the next plant, and some on the third plant. Come back the next day, come back two days later, and see if either of the, any of those plants have thicker leaves. Right? You can experiment and discern and practice and begin to find, oh, in this case, it was iron. Uh, I need to add some iron sulfate. I'm getting a functional iron deficiency. I'm not sure you'd have iron deficiencies around here, but maybe magnesium or potassium deficiencies. Um, uh, in general, when it comes to making foliar sprays, I'll give you a couple rules of thumb. Um, uh, one rule of thumb is that you always, a 2% concentration is generally considered to be um, safe. So if you're gonna be taking uh, some iron sulfate or some potassium sulfate in water, you know, take a little pint jar of water, put a couple tablespoons of potassium sulfate in. Potassium sulfate is a soluble form, of, it's a soluble salt. And uh, you know, put a lid on it and shake it up and um, when you can't get any more to dissolve in that water, you've got a saturated solution. Take a quarter cup of that and put it in a gallon of water. That's a 2% solution. And you can use that as a foliar spray to, um, to test with. A quart jar, a pint jar, doesn't really matter. You don't need that much. Uh, as much as you keep putting it in, a tablespoon at a time until it doesn't, um, and shake it up until it doesn't dissolve anymore. You do the same thing with salt. You put salt in until it doesn't dissolve anymore, and you get a saturated solution. That's as much as the water can hold. And then use a quarter of a cup to a gallon. A quarter cup of a concentrate to a gallon is generally a, considered to be a safe quantity. Um, I will repeat this over and over again. If you're ever using a salt, in this case, anything that dissolves in, in water is a salt. If you're ever using a salt, you want to always buffer it with a, an organic compound. We have something great that we use for this. It's called Soluplex. It's 37% yeah. carbon. And it's um, I've done a lot of research with it. it. You actually put it in the water before you dissolve the salt yeah. or the fertilizer, and it, it holds it, and it goes right through the leaves. And it's, just, it's really great food for microbes. So yeah, there's various products out there that you can use. Um, some you can purchase, some you can make. Uh, you know, whether you're using something really sophisticated like that, or you're going to be using a, um, you know, humates or biochar or sugar or molasses. Um, you know, anything is a carbon source will buffer the salts and, pre and prevent burning from happening. Um, um, I'm going to give you all kinds of ways to do this yourself, and then I'll tell you also that um, for those people who are like myself that mean well but don't follow through very well. Um, there are a lot of products on the market you can purchase which don't cost very much um, that you can have on hand. You've got your ready-made magnesium one, you've got your ready-made potassium one, you've got your ready-made calcium one, you've got your ready-made phosphorus one, you've got your ready-made trace elements one, you've got your ready-made all of them mixed up together. Um, and it really saves a lot of hassle. Um, and these people who are making these things are generally much better at it than we are. Um, not always necessarily a good idea, but it is absolutely an option, on, option for people. Um, when it comes to applying foliar sprays, the general rule of thumb is do not do it when the sun is shining. Uh, generally, the best time to do, apply a foliar spray is when the birds are singing, um, which is 4.30 in the morning or 7 o'clock in the evening. Uh, generally, you know, 7 o'clock in the evening is when I get around to it, even though I think uh, 4.30 in the morning is a better time to do it. Um, depending on what's in your foliar spray, uh, if you apply foliar sprays in the middle of the day, um, you can um, have them on a hot sunny day. Whatever you apply, will, the water will evaporate and you can burn the leaf, uh, depending on what's in it. So 
um, you know, in the late afternoon when the sun's on its way down, dew is beginning to set. Whatever you spray on the leaf surface is probably going to be there. It's going to be mixing with the dew. There's going to be plenty of time for that to be taken into the leaf. Um, the general concept on foliar sprays has been that they are taken in by the stomata. There's these little holes, pores on the bottom of the leaf generally, and those stomata are more likely to be open um, at dawn and dusk. And when the birds are singing, you can make stomata open by playing recordings of bird song. Um, I don't necessarily subscribe to the idea that they're being taken in by the stomata. I think that they're actually digested by the people living on the leaf surface who are then feeding them to the plant. So I know this is not necessarily common, but uh, my understanding is that these things are actually, actually they're, being, they're being eaten by the, what's called the, the, the foliar community, people on the phyllo plane. And they are fed sugars by the plant um, just as much as the people living on, on the root surface are fed sugars by the plant. Um, in many cases, nitrogen fixers and things like that are, are up there on the leaf surface. Um, all right. So generally, a couple a couple of points there. Leaf shape, um, shorter, wider leaves correlates with a higher productive potential in stockier plants. Um, longer, skinnier leaves are generally not the signs we're looking for. Uh, people may have noticed this on tomato plants. I keep going back to tomato plants. I'm not sure why, except generally people have no tomato plants and they don't know other plants. But you'll find oftentimes a big, broad, stocky kind of leaf at the bottom of the plant and these little skinny leaves at the top of the plant. Anybody seen that, noticed that? Mm -hmm. right? Right? It's the same plant, and you can still see at the bottom of the plant these big, broad, thick leaves often, and this, the top of the plant is little skinny ones. Right? That is not what should happen. That is not what should happen. The leaves should be the same throughout. They should be big and broad throughout the plant. And as the new leaves come out and they change their shape, that is symptoms of imbalances occurring. Right? And when you know how to read the leaf and read the shape, you'll understand, okay, oh, potassium coming up. Look at these leaves, they're different than these leaves. If you go out in the middle of the summer, you can read the past four weeks or the past two months in the plant, each layer of leaves. If you look at you know broccoli, a bed of broccoli or a bed of cauliflower or anything like that, you can see at this third leaf stage, you know, it was wet and this happened. And look at all these leaves at this fourth leaf stage are all full of holes, but the fifth leaf stage are all fine. You can think back about what the weather's been like and you can see how the plant responded to it, and you can really read the history of the season in the layers of leaves in the plant if you look that way. It's really interesting when you start to see things yeah. in this kind of a manner. It's really, it's really interesting. The exception would be mature forest trees, though, where you have larger solar panel leaves on, leaves on the top that are trying to capture more light. Or, right? um, do you have larger leaves necessarily on the top of the plant? I think in many cases, the oaks or like tulip tree would be a great local example. They have smaller leaves at the bottom of the tree than the top. I think Aura might be getting that confused. I know in well, the underground, like the saplings will have bigger trees. leaves on the bottom of the forest. Usually, the bigger leaves are at the bottom, and yeah, that and around. that correlates with a uh, boron deficiency. Okay. Um, you may notice this on zucchinis plants or cucumber plants. Ever seen a cucumber plant or zucchini plant that has a big <laughs> elephant ears at the bottom of the plant and as you go farther and farther up the plant they get smaller and smaller? Cucumbers? Ever seen that? Winter squash? Winter squash. Right? They they vine nicely. What's that? It's a it's a it's called a calcium deficiency, which is oftentimes caused by a boron deficiency. We'll talk about that in a minute. But you should see the same generally the same leaf size across the plant. And the broader and the thicker the leaf, the better. The shinier the leaf, the darker green the leaf, the darker green the sap, the better. The question is teasing out what it is that's causing it to be not thick or not broad or not dark green. That's the question is how do you tease this out? <clears throat> um, leaf density, plants highly littered with leaves have a higher productive capacity. Uh, leaf sap color, we talked about that. Darker color means more chlorophyll. More chlorophyll means more sugar being manufactured. Magnesium, boron, and potassium associated with this. So we can experiment with this. Um, is this a Lutz? Sorry, it's um, this chart? Mm -hmm. it's chart. Okay. Um, so we can experiment with magnesium, boron, and potassium with this leaf and spraying onto this leaf and seeing if any of those affect the plant sap color. Um, when you begin, these are skills that are difficult to teach and that come through experience. And so I, I really have to emphasize, okay. I got my little toolbox out. I got some basic, basic ballparks of how to play with this. Let me go out and experiment. 
Um, some people need to do that sort of cause and effect experimentation. Other people are willing to use intuition or dowsing or kinesiology or um, other intuitives. Um, there's many ways to figure this kind of stuff out. You can do it very linearly and scientifically. I'm going to experiment, do this here, do this here, do this here. Um, there are generally in any audience um, that I speak to at least one or two people who uh, hear the voices or receive information in one way or another. Um, those if people, if they oftentimes very shy about this skill um, and uh, they've learned this is not the kind of thing you talk about, but if you can find someone who has these attributes, these are the kind of people you want to be very respectful towards and kind and at some point maybe even a little bit obsequious. Um, would you please help me? Um, <laughs> it goes a lot faster when you can talk to somebody who can talk to the plants. It's a lot easier. Uh, I remember giving this course in, in Massachusetts a long time ago, and uh, the woman who was at, of the farm um, was the kind of person who could do this, and and uh, and you know didn't let on, didn't let on. <laughs> she called me up in the middle of the summer and, went, and said, "I was walking through the eggplants, and they said they want lemonade. What should I do?" I was like, "Well, it seems pretty easy to me. <laughs> Give them lemonade. Really? Why?" I'm like, you could ask them. They're the ones that told you. Why are you asking me? You think I know? I don't know nothing. <laughs> I'm just some kid. And I'm mad at that, right? You're the woman. You've got the intuition. You're the, you're the one they're speaking to. It's your farm. So what kind of lemonade? Ask them. Well, what could they possibly want? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm you mean, giving you some real simple things like copper, like zinc, like manganese. But we've got homeopathy. People know about homeopathy? Right? You know about homeopathy? The frequencies of in this, I mean, I was just saying, who was I saying to you? At, at lunch, like, I get this little sciatica thing sometimes when I work too hard and don't sleep enough. Mm -hmm. And my wife has these little sugar pills that she gives to me, and it's all gone. I don't know what's in the sugar pills. It's called homeopathy. I don't know which one it's called, but I can't, you know, I've been laying in bed, and I'm like, ah, I can't move. And she gives me these little sugar pills, and it goes away, and it's gone. Anybody who knows about homeopathy, like I see no reason why you can't put homeopathic remedies in a spray bottle and spray it on your plants. If you know homeopathy, do you know Bach flower essences? Do you know essential oils? Do you have, I mean, we generally have all kinds of goodies in our lives that we've been trained in through other, you know, history or we know about, et cetera, et cetera, that we can use. Um, and the, 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 um, list of ingredients is massive. There are all kinds of, you know, flowers, there's herbs you can use, you can make teas with, you know, dock or with chicory or with, I mean, there's, you can take, um, you know, tomato prunings and put them in a bucket of water and then, you know, um, make a ferment and then water your tomato plants. There are so many things we can do with naturally occurring stuff, locally occurring stuff, stuff we've got in our back pockets, stuff we've got in our kitchen cabinets, stuff we've got in the medicine cabinet. Um, that work, that absolutely work. We are, you know, no longer in the recipe section here. We are in the, you know, use whatever faculties you've got to develop your understanding and your experience and experiment and see if you can find people who are more intuitive than you are or more connected and be nice to them and invite them over and ask them if they would go for a walk and help you learn and talk to your plants. Uh, I think, you know, this is the most strategic way to do this whole process is to engage people who are more connected. Um, I oftentimes refer to the conversation about <clears throat> the indigenous communities. Um, the anthropologists, you know, as an example, were down in the Amazon um, talking to the whatever Amazonian tribes people and asked them how could you possibly have figured out that this root and this leaf are used to address this ailment. And they're like, the plants told us, duh, how else would you figure it out? Um, and the anthropologists or the, you know, the scientific medical, medical researchers sort of pat them on their <laughs> primitive little heads and say, you silly people. Um, but they get a report back from their colleagues in Australia um, that they were talking to the Aborigines and they got the same exact answer. Uh, and that's curious, until they get another report from their colleagues in Central Africa who were talking to the Maasai and they got the same answer from the Maasai also. Um, and there's another report coming from the Inuit and another report coming from the Swiss, you know, mountainer people. And, all of a sudden, we've got reports, data points, if you're a scientist, data points from all across the planet that are all agreeing with each other, all saying the plants told us. And 
our culture says plants can't tell us, we can't talk to plants. Um, like I say, if you're a scientist, if you believe in science, the principles of science, and you've got 15 data points, and 14 data points are on a line, and one data point is an outlier, what do you do with the data point as an outlier? They're not even on a line. They're, on the same They're in the same spot. Sorry, <laughs> yes. It's not even a line. It's exactly the same spot on this quadrant, and the other one's over here. 14 agree, one disagrees. What do you do with the one that disagrees? You chuck it, right? If you're a scientist, if you believe in science, when one data point disagrees with the rest of the data points, that's the outlier, that's the mistake, that's the screw up, something's wrong with that one. When our culture says it's not possible and all the rest of them say it is, maybe we're wrong. What's that? <laughs> What are they smoking? Is that what you said? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, no. <laughs> Whatever they're on, I want some of that. <laughs> they all found it? In Australia? <laughs> Up in Alaska? If it's any comfort, there are a lot of older Christian hymns that speak of this very thing. All nature sings and round me rings the wonders of the spheres. Categorically. I, I'll, I'll get to the science of it in a minute. I mean, I, we have good Western scientists who are agreeing with this, right? Our formal published literature agrees with this. And yet what we are taught in school and what our media, you know, sort of conveys is, is an entirely false perspective. Um, anyway, I continue. I'll attempt to continue.